Hey everybody, welcome back. This video I want to cover relational graph convolutional networks or RGCNs. So this is a follow-up video to my previous on GCNs, graph convolutional networks. So if you don't know what they are, you should definitely start there. Uh, this video is about expanding those concepts to handle heterogeneous graphs where you have nodes or edges of different types within the same graph. So for instance, you might have a tweet and you might have an account and those are different things. So our GCNs are about handling that sort of data structure using GCN-like approaches. So before we get there, let me mention I have a mailing list where I send out updates for live stream talks, uh, blog posts, and new videos, stuff like that. So uh, a link is in the description below. Also, we have a Discord server. The community's really been growing. Uh, we're starting to get that critical mass of people where the conversation is rolling and it's not just me. So uh, please join, contribute your questions and your expertise. So with that, I'll move on to relational graph convolutional networks. Let's kick this off by giving a little recap of graph convolutional networks. So to apply a GCN layer to a node, which updates its embedding, you follow three main steps. The first is that you collect the node representations of all the connected neighbors. The second step is that you aggregate those vectors in some way. So for instance, using an average function. And then the third step is that you pass it through a dense neural network layer. And that means you multiply it by a weight matrix and then apply an activation function. So it's this third step that I want to draw attention to the fact that there's only one W matrix, one weight matrix that's shared across all of the nodes. It's not as if each node has learned its own projection matrix. For a single layer, there's one weight matrix. And you see this if you look at the equation in the Kiffin Welling paper. And you'll notice on the left hand side, there's HI L plus one. So HI is the node embedding of node i. L plus one is just the, the layer that we're talking about. And then on the right hand side, you'll see there's a sum over ni, which is the neighbors of node i. And it's summing up h, j, l. So that's the node embeddings of the previous layer of all of the neighbors. And cij is the normalization constant. So if you're using average, that would just be something like the degree of node i. And then once you normalize and sum all of the neighboring things, you multiply it by WL, which is the linear projection matrix. And notice that there's no I or J on WL, it's just WL. And that's because for layer L, there's only one W and it's shared by all the nodes. So to recap, we take all the neighbors, we aggregate them by summing them together, we normalize that, we apply a linear projection, which is W, and then we apply the nonlinear activation function, which is here re represented by sigma. So the last thing we need before we get to RGCNs is to talk about knowledge graphs. So a knowledge graph can be thought of as being built by triples, where you have source node, relation type, and destination node. So in the world of Twitter, you might have Zach follows Thomas Kiff, and then you might also have Jan LeCun retweets Yannick Kilcher tweet 127035. So in just this tiny little graph, you have two different node types. You have people nodes and you have tweet nodes. And then you also have different relation types. So you have a follows relation and a retweet relation. So if you think about GCNs, there's this operation of gathering all the neighbors and averaging them together. And that doesn't really make sense in this context because why would you treat all of these things the same when aggregating to get a node representation? So to provide a very specific example, let's say you have person A follows person B, and then you also have person A blocks person C. If you're updating the node representation of person A, does it really make sense to just average together B and C as if they're the same, even though in one case they're following and in the other case they're blocking? So relational GCNs solve this essentially by having different projection matrices for each unique type of triple. So 
person blocks person would have one W matrix and person follows person would have a different W matrix. And those matrices are not specific to particular nodes. It's just specific to that type of triple. So let's get some more understanding by looking at the equation that's comparable to the previous one, but now in the world of RGCNs. So the first thing you notice is there's another sum term, and this one is over R. So R represents the relation type. So these are the person blocks person and person follows person. And then you'll notice that the R is on a, a couple other things. It's on the in, the neighborhood, and that's because when you're doing the, the next sum, you only consider neighbors of a particular type R. The other thing is on W. So it's not just WL anymore, it's WLR. And that's because each relation type has its own projection matrix. So if before each GCN layer had one W, now each GCN layer has R Ws, where R is the number of unique relation types. There's one other difference here. There's this W0 term. Now W0 is giving special attention to self connections. And if you think about this in the context of GCNs, it doesn't quite make sense, at least to me, that you would give equal treatment to a node's own vector when updating itself. It seems that you would want to give it special treatment. And that's what RGCN does. It gives a self-connection its own special type and its own special projection matrix. So we still gather neighbors and aggregate them and project them and pass them through a nonlinearity. But in this case, we do the aggregation and projection based on relation type first. And the idea is that the projection matrices will put them in the same space so that when you sum them together, it can make some semantic sense of what's going on. So in the case of blocks and follows, you might imagine that um, at a high level, blocks and follows might point in separate directions once the vector is projected down into the space. So that person A blocks person B might cancel out the vector of person A follows person B. So hopefully this provides some intuition for why you might want to have different projection matrices based on relation type. Our GCNs are going to have more parameters than GCN because each relation type is going to have its own W. And that can be a problem if, if you have a lot of relation types, especially if some of them are rare. So the paper gets around this by proposing two different ways of regularizing these things. And the first way is called basis decomposition. And in this framework, you specify the number of unique Ws that you want to have for the layer. And then each of the WRs is calculated by combining those components and linearly. So they learn a coefficient for each of the components. So with no regularization, each relation type has its own projection matrix. But with maximal regularization, you say, OK, I only want one shared weight matrix. But each of the relation types would then learn some coefficient to scale it. So uh, on the other hand, if you had 100 relation types and you said, I only want two basis, then each of the 100 relation types would learn two coefficients, one to scale the first and one to scale the second. So it's a linear combination of the number of components. And this is basically just a weight sharing scheme. So in the world of the Twitter example we were just talking about, where you have a blocks and a follows, maybe it doesn't make sense to have two totally separate weight matrices for those two, because they're kind of semantically similar. Maybe instead you have one weight matrix and it would turn out that the coefficient for um, blocks is negative one and the coefficient for follows is positive one. So you have the same weight matrix but different coefficients that scale that. The other type of regularization technique they present is called block diagonal decomposition. And this basically just takes small matrices and stacks them uh, diagonally in a bigger matrix. And the idea is that many of the parameters or the values in this matrix will be zero. So the way they motivate this and as a sensible choice is they claim that there are variables that are strongly interconnected within the group, 
but don't have much interaction outside of that group. And this sort of structure of the matrix just codifies that. So as an example, you might expect to represent a person, their physical characteristics like height and weight might be important. And maybe their political affiliation is important as well. But you might not expect much interaction between those two groups of variables. So the elements of the matrix that would codify those interactions are just set to zero. But at the end of the day, this is just a way to reduce the number of parameters in the matrices and therefore um, not overfit. I hope this gives you an intuition for relational GCNs. At the end of the day, it's really that with traditional GCNs, you throw away all information about node type and relation type. And our GCNs allow you to leverage that. And in the case that we gave with Twitter, blocks, and follows, this is obviously a critical distinction. These things are very different, and to treat them the same is a mistake. So this really opens the doors to modeling knowledge graphs and, and relational heterogeneous graphs, which are pretty pervasive in the world. So hopefully this helps. I'll see you next time.